So this video is going to cover a topic known as junctional diversity. This is a pretty confusing topic, so if you don't like the explanation I give, it's covered in the textbook, um, and there's a nice figure in the textbook that goes over it. But I'm going to show you the process in action, and hopefully um, it'll make sense. Uh, this process uh, called junctional diversity is going to increase antibody diversity many fold. So let's back up. Uh, during somatic recombination um, in B cells, uh, the gene segments need to be linked together in order to produce a functional open reading frame. So for example, in the heavy chain gene in a B cell, when it's developing in the bone marrow, the RAG enzymes have to choose a variable gene segment, a diversity gene segment, and a junctional gene segment, and has to cut and paste them together, right? So I've chosen, let's say this B cell I drew here, chose V14, D6, and J2. And that's going to give rise to some uh, nucleotide sequence that gives rise to an amino acid sequence, an open reading frame, that gives rise to some protein with a certain 3D shape in its variable region. So that was somatic recombination. Let's say another B cell, while it's developing, it just happens to choose the exact same V and D and J gene segments. Does that happen? Sure it does. The number of possible combinations is a little over 5,000, right? So as a B cell developing near bone marrow, the odds that two B cells pick the exact same VDJ gene segments in the heavy chain gene, it's about one in 5,520. So of course it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen often. Uh, figuring the fact that this, uh, these cells, millions of these cells develop in your bone marrow every day, odds are it's going to happen. But these cells will end up making slightly different proteins because of a process known as junctional diversity. And so what this process is going to do is going to introduce random nucleotides in the junctions between gene segments so that when you have an open reading frame in the top B cell, an open reading frame in the bottom B cell, they are not 100% identical. There's going to be differences between these two, even though they're using the same exact DNA gene sequences. So let's talk about how you get junctional diversity between the gene segments. So let's say so on the top, we've got um, one B cell, what's going on in one B cell in the bone marrow. On the bottom, we've got another B cell in the bone marrow. And so these two B cells have happened to have chosen the exact same diversity gene segment. Let's say number six, there are about 23 of them. Let's say it chose six. And the junctional uh, or the joining um, gene segment, there are six of them. Let's say they each chose the second. Great. So um, what's going to happen? So remember from the last video, the RAG enzymes, uh, those are the recombination enzymes. They are the enzymes that land on the RSS sequences, cut the DNA. And so let's say the RAGs in the top cell and the bottom cell just happen to have landed on the exact same RSSs and cut and want are going to paste these two DJs together, right? So I'm going to redraw them here and I'm actually going to draw some nucleotides here. So let's start with the diversity gene segment. So when the RAG enzyme, uh, it cuts, it lands on the RSSs, it's going to cut the DNA, so it will cut both the top and the bottom strand. But what the RAG enzymes are going to do, you, DNA does not like to be open. It does not like to have exposed 5 and 3 prime end. That's very dangerous to have those just lying around. So what the RAG enzymes do when they land on the RSSs and they cut both strands of DNA, the top and bottom strand, they are actually going to take those strands and link them together into a hairpin. So the RAG enzymes do this. They cut the DNA and then they link the top and bottom strands together. And so you have a hairpin forming at the end of the diversity gene segment. Okay. Uh, what about the joining gene segments? I'm going to draw some nucleotides in here because we've got to look at the nucleotide level. And again, when the RAG enzymes cut the DNA, they seal it with hairpins. You don't want to have exposed five and three prime ends just lying around. So, uh, and this is going to happen in all gene segments. So anytime the rags cut, they're going to make these hairpins so you don't have open and free five and three prime ends just lying around. Okay, so what's going to happen now? 
Well, we want to join these together, but something's going to happen at the junction between the D and the J gene segments. So let's jump ahead here. So the hairpins were formed by the RIG enzymes. Now these uh, two um, hairpins are dragged together in close proximity with one another. And now the RIG enzymes are going to open up the hairpin. So they're going to again cut the DNA again, and then um, we're going to see something happen. So where are the RIG enzymes going to cut? Are they going to cut exactly where they sealed the DNA together? No, not necessarily. The RIG enzyme randomly will look at this uh, hairpin area and randomly pick two nucleotides to cut between. Right? That's not very exact, is it? No, it's not. That's actually a good thing. So let's say in this top cell, the RIG enzyme has chosen to cut between that T and that A on the bottom strand. And the RIG enzyme lands near that hairpin next to the J, and it has landed between the A and the T on the top strand, and it's going to cut there. So when the RIG enzymes cut DNA, it's going to unfold them like this. Now, the DNA looks a little different from when we started, and that's okay. So the RIG enzymes, they make the hairpins, then they're going to cut the hairpins when we're ready to join these two pieces of DNA together. Um, at the bottom cell, right, chose the same D, chose the same J, but the RIG enzyme has just, they've decided to cut at a different place. They randomly chose on the bottom between the A and the G. On the top, they chose between the T and the A. And now when this unfolds, that looks a little different. So um, these nucleotides that are between the two uh, gene segments, well, they're in a little different order. And that's okay, we'll see how this plays out shortly. So are we ready to join these two pieces of DNA together yet? No, there's one more step, actually two more steps, uh, between this uh, before we're ready to join them together. So another enzyme is going to come in, and that enzyme is called TDT, which stands for Terminal Deoxynucleotide Transferase. So this is a very special enzyme, and it is uh, turned on in B cells that are developing in the bone marrow, and it's going to add nucleotides to the terminus of DNA, specifically the th free three prime ends in these joints. So let's watch. What's TDT going to do? TDT is going to go to that top strand and it's going to randomly insert nucleotides, which is really strange to think there's an enzyme that's putting random nucleotides into your DNA permanently. That's okay. This is all going to turn out fine in the end. So TDT. Uh, lands on the top strand and just starts randomly putting nucleotides. It's not like a DNA polymerase that requires a template. It doesn't require any template. It just starts randomly stitching nucleotides together. So it's going to put on, extend the three prime end of the top strand. It's going to extend the three prime end on the bottom strand, randomly putting nucleotides in. Kind of strange. I agree. In the bottom cell, there's TDT enzyme, and it's going to, to randomly put nucleotides on the top strand, randomly put in nucleotides on the bottom strand. And if you look between these two B cells now, they are definitely not identical anymore. Now you've got random nucleotides put in between these junctions of the DNA segments. All right, well, how are we still going to join these two things together? So what's going to happen next is, by chance, some of the nucleotides on the top strand will base pair with nucleotides on the bottom strand. So you can see there uh, an AG has aligned with the TC from the bottom strand. In that bottom cell, it just so happened that there was a TTG sequence that aligned nicely and base paired nicely with the AAC sequence. So now you've got random chance, by random chance, um, alignment between the top and the bottom strands. That's great. Another enzyme comes in, cleans out anything that doesn't line up. So now we've got some um, base pairing between the top and bottom strand. I'm going to line that, I'm going to shift and line that up a little prettier. And now that we've got um, alignment, DNA polymerase can actually come in and use the bottom strand as a template and synthesize the top strand. And now all we, we can fill in the entire joint between the gene segments. Now, if you look at the joint, they are different. And that's where diversity comes in. So we, uh, the top B cell, it chose a D and a J. The bottom B cell chose the exact same D, 
the exact same J, but the junction between the two are different. So when the open reading frame is going to be read eventually, if you um, transcribe and translate, you're going to see that the amino acids that these this gene encodes are slightly different, right? So the top strand now has instructions for an alanine, serine, threonine, valine, tyrosine. The bottom strand, even though you started with the same D and the same J, the open reading frame is different. Alanine, serine, leucine, arginine, isoleucine, phenylalanine. So the uh, uh, proteins are going to be slightly different from one another. And this is because you have the variable region of the heavy chain in the top cell. There is the junction between the two is different. In the bottom cell, so the top and bottom cell use the exact same, could have used the exact same D and J, but the junction between the two are different. So this is known as junctional diversity. Um, and uh, we have some nomenclature here that we need to define in, junctional, in terms of junctional diversity. So if you look at the um, blue nucleotides in this junction between the gene segments, the blue nucleotides on the top B cell and the bottom C cell, B cell, they are slightly different. These are called the P nucleotides and they originated from the hairpin and something the P stands for palindromic nucleotide. So hairpins kind of produce a little palindrome and um, depending on where the hairpin is cut and unfolded, the P nucleotides can be different from one cell to the next if they, if they decided to use the same uh, DNA sequences. The red nucleotides, they are referred to as N nucleotides. And again, if you look at the top cell and the bottom cell, they are different. The N nucleotides are different, odds are, because the enzyme TDT, they're just gonna put in random nucleotides and hope for a random matching of the top and bottom strands. So this is junctional diversity. The joints between two gene segments is generated in a pretty random fashion. This is great because this is going to give you another layer of antibody diversity. And your book uh, gives the number of three times 10 to the seventh. That is the um, potential increase in antibody diversity um, given by the uh, possible joints that can be encoded between the V and the D and the J gene segments. So when we talk about how many different antigen binding sites you could make, how many different antibodies you can make, when we talk about antibody diversity, um, there are lots of different things that contribute to that, right? So again, the antigen binding site is formed from the variable region of the heavy chain protein and the variable region of the light chain protein. And from the last few videos, we've learned that the variable uh, region of the heavy chain protein is um, constructed using VDJ gene segments. And again, you can pick a number of different ones depending on um, where the RAG, RAG enzymes land on the RSSs. The light chain gene, again, um, the variable region of the light chain protein is made from a V and a J gene segment put together. And if you look at those little red lines, that's the junctional diversity. And there is junctional diversity generated between the V and the D, between the D and the J, and between the V and the J in the light chain. In that little animation we covered before, I just showed you between the D and the J in the heavy chain, but junctional diversity happens between all junctions of gene segments. So that means when we talk about how many different antibodies you can make, or how many different antigen binding sites can you generate, um, it involves all the different things that can give you diversity in your genes for heavy chain and light chain. So we had somatic recombination, we covered that before. The random um, linking of a V and a D and a J by the RAG enzymes in the heavy chain or the random linking of a V and a J in the light chain. So somatic recombination is gonna give you some diversity. You also have the different combinations of light chains and heavy chains. So um, remember, you have two heavy chain genes, one maternal, one paternal. So when a B cell is developing in the bone marrow, which one is it going to choose? It can choose one or the other. In terms of the light chain genes, there are two different light chain genes, light chain kappa and light chain lambda. And again, you have maternal and paternal for both of those. So when a B cell is developing, it can choose one of four light chain genes 
to make a um, light chain protein. So that different those combinations give you about you know one times ten to the one point six times ten to the six possible combinations of heavy chain light chain proteins. But then you add junctional diversity to that, where you have this other level of possible outcomes due to the random amino acids that are present between the gene segments, that gives you a 3 times 10 to the 7th increase in diversity. So when you multiply those two together, you get something like 5 times 10 to the 13th possible different antigen binding sites. And that is very high. Uh, although in theory, um, it's observed that you, you never, not one, one person never seems to get that high, but it uh, has been observed about 10 to the 9th possible combinations um, in terms of how many antigen binding sites one person can make. That's still a pretty big number, right? Um, so that's uh, the role of junctional diversity, which I know is confusing, um, in uh, generating antibody diversity.